All right, so I think we'll start. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening uh, to this for the special event. My name is Lior Sternfeld. I'm Associate Professor of History and Jewish Studies here at Penn State. And I'm, I'm delighted to welcome you to this event, which has been the fruit of collaboration between uh, many units across campus. Um, I, I want to thank the sponsor of this event, uh, first of all, the Department of History, um, the Pasquerilla Center, and, uh, and Bob, who has been a wonderful partner to many projects and unfortunately cannot be here, the Department of uh, Germanic and Slavic Languages and Literatures, uh, the Penn State All Sports Museum and its interim director, Lou Lazarov, um, whom you're going to hear very shortly, and the Penn State uh, Jewish Studies Program. Um, I want to thank uh, Amber and Andrew here. Where is Andrew? Uh, for doing, <laughs> for doing all the so much of the of the work behind the scenes uh, towards this event, and of course uh, this event um, came to existence uh, when I visited uh, the FC Bayern Munich Museum uh, this last summer, and I met uh, with Alexa. And, uh, and we thought that it can be a wonderful opportunity to bring it to Penn State. So thank you, Alexa, for, uh, for helping to initiate it. Um, we are going to, um, to hear uh, five speakers today. Um, I, maybe I should make an announcement that I'll be joining uh, Bayern Munich for next season. <laughs> um, so it's been a wonderful ride here at Penn State. Now I'm <laughs> off to the next adventure. <laughs> um, I'll present uh, each speaker um, before they take the stage. Uh, the first is uh, Dee Kandra. Uh, Dee Kandra leads the ov and oversees the advancement of FC Bayern Munich uh, strategic objectives in the Americas and works directly with the headquarters in Munich to drive organizational success. She joined FC Bayern in, uh, in 2017 as head of marketing and communication to lead the club audience development and brand positioning strategy within North, Central, and South America. In that time, the club has successfully increased their America's fan base and further established its brand in the region. Prior to joining FC Bayern, Kandra acquired a wealth of international experience holding senior roles in, uh, in, at the New York Cosmos, uh, the Liverpool and Liverpool FC, as well as working on Berkeley's global sponsorship of the Premier League uh, at Lexus Agency. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much for um, having us today and taking the time to be here. Thank you, Leo, for visiting Munich and meeting Alexa those, those years ago. Um, so there's no denying the power of soccer and sport and its ability to make a positive difference to our communities. We see this during times of war and even pandemics where sport is often the only unifying factor and the source of joy. We believe at FC Bayern that we have a responsibility to talk about our past, the good and the bad, to encourage conversation and education, to ensure that atrocities of the past do not happen again. We want to live in an inclusive society where differences are embraced and celebrated, and therefore we must lead by example. To be able to share our history with you today is humbling, and we hope that what you take from this evening is a deeper understanding of FC Bayern Munich and our commitment to responsible practice both on and off the field. Thank you so much and I hope you really enjoy this exhibition because it's fantastic. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is uh, Lou Lazarov, uh, class of 1993 Penn State alumnus. Uh, Lou Lazarov served as a 23-year career as an educator in New Jersey before returning to his alma mater uh, in 2017 as an instructor with the program in writing and rhetoric in the Department of English. He has co-authored two histo histories of the Penn State uh, Blue Band. In March of 2022, he joined the Penn State All Sports Museum full-time uh, as the program and education coordinator, heading the museum's docent corps organizing uh, the public tour programs and creating educational outreach uh, components for both the main gallery exhibit and the current I Am Penn Stater Nathan Lyons in World War II. 
uh, special exhibit, including the popular ongoing trading card series. Since October, he has been serving as the museum uh, interim director, and uh, he is one of the first uh, partners in creating this program. So thank you so very much, Luen. The floor is yours. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. It's great to see you all here. Um, everybody can hear me okay? I apologize. I have to wear the mask today. But, um, uh, I think I'm officially designated as the, the warm-up act uh, leading into uh, the official program, so I will definitely uh, sort of keep my remarks brief and on target um, because there's a lot more and more interesting things to, to, to come. Um, uh, it's, it's my privilege to, um, uh, to be here today. To, um, to have had Leo reach out to us um, uh, to, to be invited to be a co-sponsor to this program. Um, uh, obviously, supporting uh, sport and its study um, is uh, clearly one of the mandates of uh, a museum like the Penn State All Sports Museum. So to be a part of, of a program like this uh, is, is a real special privilege and a, and a joy. Um, so it's an honor for us, for me, for the museum to be a part of this program. And certainly my thanks to Lior for his tireless work in, in making this, this possible. Um, uh, uh, and certainly for uh, making it possible for us to be able to experience this exhibit uh, firsthand. Um, uh, also, welcome to our honored guests. Um, uh, we're really thrilled to have you here as well. Um, and ecstatic to have the opportunity to learn more of this history directly from you. Uh, I, I was thinking about it, and I think that I can reasonably estimate that um, uh, in the 45 odd years since I started preschool at the Jewish Community Center back in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, I don't think that a single year has gone past that I haven't learned something new about the period of the Second World War and, and of the Holocaust. Um, and I, I guess this really isn't or shouldn't be surprising because such a, a sprawling and complex event of that um, involving and affecting uh, hundreds of millions of, of lives, um, as it did, cannot be easily understood. So I, I don't think that my own experience is necessarily so uncommon, um, but what I found in sort of looking back and, and thinking about how I was thinking about that period of history, I, I saw that where I probably started as everyone did by looking at the broad strokes of history and military campaigns and political decisions and textbook sorts of things, I, I eventually began to scroll my focus downward to a more personal sort of level to the, to the finer points of that period of history um, to the point where my greatest interest was in the individual stories that originated out of that particular period. I think that I probably credit Studs Terkel's The Good War as being the first time that I looked at something and said, oh, yeah, the stories, the individual stories, they matter. Those voices lending us the benefit of their individual perspectives on a moment in history. Voices that if they didn't tell those stories, if they had not been recorded and preserved, that they would have been lost to us forever. So I think we should count ourselves fortunate then to be here today to discuss a portion of that history that might otherwise have gone completely unheard. Bayern and its struggle to survive within Hitler's Germany, a story that exists because of small but powerful acts in the face of overwhelming oppression and survives because of the dedicated efforts of historians and archivists and museum professionals who helped to preserve it across the decades and then works to bring it to full public view. So in reading the publications that talk about Byron in the 1930s in this exhibit, I was captivated by the recurrence of one particular phrase that popped up over and over again, small acts of personal courage. A phrase which seems to speak to the most essential quality upon which all progress in every human endeavor, whether political, scientific, artist, or athletic, has relied. Uh, a personal sort of connection, right? Last month, my wife and I took a trip to uh, the Czech Republic. Um, and as any good museum professional does, I spent some time exploring museums in the Czech Republic. Because, you know, it's a tax write-off. Um, and, you know, to compare notes, to borrow good ideas that I might come across. Borrow is a loose term for steal outright. Um, but one particular place that I had long desired to, um, to visit 
was um, uh, the museum in the village of Lidice, which was dedicated to memorializing the town and its citizens who were the victims of a massacre perpetrated by the SS in 1943. It had been Hitler's directive that as a reprisal for the assassination of Reinhard Heydrich, that Lidice, the town, and all of its occupants would die forever, obliterated from the face of the earth and entirely forgotten. But the museum that stands in place of that village today enshrines the fragments of those people's lives, recovered from the rubble of dynamited buildings, a purse, a hat, a family photograph, the little bell that hung over the village's school door. And doing so, and eternally defies the fascist decree that Lidice would be remembered and not forgotten. So this desire to remember, to push back against forgetting, which I think forgetting is in many ways akin to death, that's what draws us here together today. Bayern of the 1930s, its people, their small acts of courage, defiance of what seemingly could not be defied, rescues it from the death of forgetting. Sports museums are, are funny sorts of places, and they so often defy our visitors' expectations. Uh, I've long since lost track of the number of times that visitors have come into our museum with preconceived notions about what they'll see, notions that are born out of the love that they have for their team and for athletic accomplishment, but they leave with something vastly more important an appreciation of athletes' humanity, small acts of courage, remembered long after the cheers are quieted. As sports museums, if we recorded only the win-loss record and displayed only the championship trophies, we would be telling only a part of the story, and arguably not the most important part. Uh, for me, the photo of Bayern's um, uh, uh, Willie Simstreiter um, standing smiling next to Jesse Owens tells us nothing without the story behind it, without the context of the years that led up to the 1936 Berlin Olympics, which give it the fullest possible meaning, um, a, a meaning that is, is, I don't know, I find hard to express in words. So we're grateful. We're grateful to Alexa. We're grateful for your team, for everyone in the Bayern organization, and not just for bringing this exhibition here and telling us this history, but for the additional work that you've done to make education a priority. Um, uh, I was reading just last night when uh, an article in which uh, Byron's club president was quoted as saying, a club with our appeal has a responsibility to get involved in society, seeking to create a culture of remembrance. That, I think, is a sentiment that Penn Staters well understand and agree with. Athletic success makes sports museums a reality. And the museum itself then extends its reach beyond the pitch, beyond the gridiron, beyond the court, to give us more of the humanity within athletic history. By having this exhibit here, we are honored to become willing participants in that culture of remembrance. The Jewish history of FC Bayern and the small acts of personal courage that helped preserve it will never again be forgotten. We're very glad to have you here. Thank you all so much. I'm really looking forward to what it is that comes next, as I'm sure you are as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lou. Um, the next speaker is Alexa Gettinger. Uh, she's the curator of the FC Bayern uh, Museum at the Allianz Arena Stadium in Munich, uh, Germany. She is, with her team, responsible for the content of the permanent exhibition of Germany's biggest club museum, which uh, includes historical research and how it is displayed. She is also responsible for the uh, special exhibitions, which are held uh, two to four times per year. Uh, she supervises the visitors' program, including the ped pedagogical programs for students, refugees, and those with special needs. Alexa is, uh, is also part of the team uh, for commemoration, work of the uh, work of the club, for example, the Holocaust Remembrance Day, and uh, uh, the special touring exhibition uh, for Jewish members before joining. Uh, sorry, before joining FC Bayern in 2014, Alexa worked in various cultural museums in in Munich and the University of uh, Tübingen, and I'm sure that I didn't pronounce it. <laughs> well, <laughs> she studied modern and contemporary history in Munich and in Salamanca, Spain. Alexa, the floor is yours. Hi, 
Hello, everybody. So, oh, yes. Okay. okay, here it comes. So you can't see me then, right? So <laughs> <laughs> now, anyway, hi everybody. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and also for the invitation, Leo. And it's a great pleasure for me to be here. All the, uh, well on personal grounds because for me it's just great to be back in the United States but also on professional grounds because um, I think it's so important to cherish the relationships between two countries um, and it's so important to have the personal relationship so um, I really appreciate it. Um, today I will talk about the soccer club FC Bayern Munich um, about its history and also about the Jewish history which the club has and also about the historical research uh, which we have done. Um, but before I get started, I'm interested in, um, has anyone been to Munich before? Oh, okay, many, well, great. Um, and who have used a soccer fan? Just, oh, also many, perfect. Uh, now, then maybe what comes to your mind when you think of FC Bayern? Do you have a, an idea or a thought what you might share? <laughs> well, so it's, it's still a known, a known, unknown thing, but um, I hope I can bring it uh, closer to you. Um, well, nobody mentioned now the NFL Munich game. I thought that would be a good start, maybe. Um, because we just had the Super Bowl, although I learned it was not a football game, it was Rihanna concert interrupted <laughs> by a football game. <laughs> okay, I kind of like that. Um, but our contribution to that was actually the Munich game. It was the first regular season game on German soil in November, and it was like a real great party in whole Munich. So the bars partnered with the NFL fan bases, you know, and the whole city was kind of in a football mood, so we kind of tried that. And I think um, the reason why the NFL chose Munich um, as a place to have it is probably because the club, of course, stands for, for several things and above all for sporting records. And I just want to um, introduce that to you. Um, now, here's that's a picture from our museum. Um, FC Bayern, when it was founded in the year 1900, we won 32 times the German championship. Now, number two is ranking with nine titles, so you see there's already a very big gap. <laughs> and um, that's actually our, the trophy, we call it salad bowl, so it's not a super bowl, it's a salad bowl, but <laughs> one anyway. And then um, maybe another picture from the museum, uh, that's probably the most um, photographed showcase in the museum because it's the treble. I mean, actually, you see not only three um, trophies, but six. So that was the most successful year in history where we won within one year six trophies out of six possible trophies. And so only two clubs in Europe have done that. That's Barcelona and FC Bayern. So um, that's a very nice thing about it. And maybe um, just to add this, um, FC Bayern won that treble in the year 2020, so under COVID conditions. And I think um, this maybe shows a good crisis resilience in these times. I mean, the club stands for a lot of values. I think stability is one, definitely. Also, the serious financial management would be one, which we're known for, I, I can say. And um, also other things like continuity and things like that. So the club now today has 1,200 employees and um, we had a total turnover last year of 666 million euros. So and what is also maybe special in that club is that we have many former active soccer players on the board and as functionaries. Um, that's also something which other clubs try to do, but I think this is a very big tradition in the club. Okay, now uh, maybe Again, before I get into history, um, some of our heroes and legends, of course, um, because you always have to 
uh, remembering the names of it. Um, well, one is Robert Lewandowski, he was a Polish player, and he um, is our GOAT, uh, so to speak. Um, he scored 41 goals in one Bundesliga season, that was two years ago, and he was also um, elected by the FIFA as the best football player of the world, twice times in a row. And then the other one is Franz Beckenbauer. I don't know if he's still familiar here. I mean, he's now 77 years old. And he ended his career at uh, New York Cosmos. So that's why I took a picture here with the skyline of New York. And I mean, he won everything on club and national team level, what you ever could win. And he managed to win the world championship as a player and as a coach. And then he brought the world championship to Germany in the year 2006. So there's not anything to add, I think. Um, and that was actually the reason why this, our home stadium, the Allianz Arena, was built because of that um, World Championship. Um, okay, now this was um, something, and maybe I'll just give you a little insight of what the feeling is if you are a Bayern fan. Let's see if this video clip works. FC Bayern to success like Munich to the Alps, <coughs> like Beckenbauer to number five, like Muller to scoring goals. But that's just the beginning. Because at FC Bayern, success means more. The FC Bayern steht für Miteinander und für Vielfalt. Our members are not just a strong support base. They are the feeling of belonging. Our followers don't just follow us. They share our passion. Our history has never held us back. It always pushes us forward as an independent club. Bayern München muss immer Bayern München bleiben. Our fans support us and motivate us to do our best, everywhere and anytime. That's why we are committed to always giving back to them. We are one team, one club, one community, deeply rooted in Bavaria, uniting fans all over the world, on eye level, and open to everyone who lives our values. We don't just inspire through our heroes. We have club legends and top scorers, no question, but what really lets us shine is our unity. We stand together. When we're up, and especially when we're down, because we believe that we can achieve anything if we are one. We lead with heart and a commitment to our values, a commitment that is timeless, bigger than one player, one team, one sport, bigger than sports. So when it gets loud, that's just a symbol for our passion. We stay committed to our way, and inspire others to join us. That's what has made, makes, and always will make us successful. We are who we are. Mia San Mia. Okay, now that was first a little insight, first feeling, um, but maybe I have to do some clear clarification about uh, what a soccer club or a sports club in Germany really is because there are some differences to um, what you might consider maybe a soccer club. Um, well, there's something very German about having a club because we just love to found clubs. So if you ever want to become a president or, or be on a board, you just come to Germany and found a club and <laughs> you are somebody very important. And there's the saying from the 19th century um, that goes, whenever few Germans get together, they create an association. Um, so uh, this is actually something coming from the 19th century in which an um, insane amount happened in society, people freed themselves from the um, fixed st structures of the estates and aristocratic houses and became more self-determined. People joined together in a new way, had more free time and founded clubs for everything. So there were clubs for traditional costumes, you know, for car enthusiasts, for anti-alcoholic movement for whatever, Knipe cold water movement, all kinds of sports, reform, closing, so for everything. So 
like in Munich in the year 1910, we had 4,500 different clubs. And I'd say, you know, apart from maybe the family, the job, and then the third um, social parameter in your life was probably being a club member. And um, actu actually, still today, these clubs are non-profit organizations. They pay less taxes, and they're based primarily on volunteer work. So contributions are often very low, like my kids, for example, they would go in a soccer and a swimming club. They pay maybe a fee of $150 per year, and the coaches would do all voluntarily, more or less. So that's actually how social life is um, organized. And um, on the average, every German is a member of a club, I'd say. <laughs> so I think you have to, it's important to know that, uh, you know, to see the difference. And of course, Bayern is also one of the clubs with the most members in the world. And maybe let's have a short, just a short um, look at the structure of the club because there are also some differences. Well, first of all, we have almost 300,000 uh, members um, in our nonprofit organization. Um, uh, maybe it's important to know that we founded a non-publicly listed star corporation in 2002, and the club holds 75% uh, stake in it. Um, because there's this rule and law in Germany that at least 51% of the shares of a commercial subsidiary of a soccer club must remain in the ownership of the parent club. So we are um, quite independent from an investor, so the, the majority um, stays within the club. Um, now this is maybe important also to understand, you know, what a club means to the people. And that now leads us to the foundation, um, because this is also maybe important to understand that there's a real big spirit about it. And I went to New York last year, and we um, visited the Yankee Stadium. And you know, I was—he wasn't saying anything about the foundation. And I asked the guide about it, and then he said, "Well." There was just this businessman, and then he bought the players, and they just got started, you know. <laughs> and I'm like, what? <laughs> For us, the foundation is like a real myth, and uh, there's so much spirit there, which we try to focus on still today. So um, the thing is that probably um, soccer was not a very popular sport around 1900 in Germany, not at all. I mean, the main sport was gymnastics. And um, so when they founded a soccer club, that was this uh, was kind of a real revolutionary thing about it. Um, I mean, the gymnastics um, worked totally different. Uh, in the 19th century, it came up rather for military reasons. And later, it was still organized with many restrictions. So they had no sporting competition, no earning money. And they always needed to keep the order and the lines. You know, when, when somebody was doing it, everybody did the same and, and copied it. Soccer, on the contrary, came from a foreign country, from England, was individually played, 22 white men running around the pitch, you know, um, uh, um, um, making the lawn uh, holes in it and uh, so that was always being criticized and it was not considered of being a good educational means for the youth then so for many fans then the new sports stood for something more liberal something freer and this excited young sophisticated people in particular and it was typical for the soccer movement in Germany then uh, to be um, in academic and bourgeois circles and also to develop in big cities. So not in small ones. It was yeah, like in England in the beginning maybe. So Munich was around 1900 one of the most important cities in Europe for arts and culture. Like authors like Thomas Mann were there, many um, painters, impressionists, expressionists were there, also many women painters because the women's movement was quite big um, in, at the turn of the century. And so some of the 17 founders of the FC Bayern Munich also came to Munich because of arts. So at least six of them were art students or more of them were even related, were photographers or merchants or things like that. 
They came from all parts of Germany, which is actually remarkable because Bavarians like to stay <laughs> at one place. So even the first president of FC Bayern, Franz John, he came from near Berlin, which most Munich people don't know, <laughs> I think. And the second president came from the, the Netherlands. And um, yes, later on, I'm now going further in history, in 1913, there was also a man called Adolf Hitler, and he also came to Munich because he considered himself as, a, as an artist. He, he also painted postcards, and he came to Munich also because of that fame, actually. And he also fled from compulsory military service. Um, he then founded the National Socialistic Movement in Munich. I mean, Munich had a special role in this whole movement. It was in the year 1920, and he also started his seizure of power in Munich. And um, so Munich had the special role, and it was also later um, the capital of the movement. That was an official title Munich was given. Um, okay, but now back to the foundation, foundation times. That was still a way before uh, National Socialism. Um, Maybe just the, the foundation story goes like this, that most of these um, soccer players had played before as a soccer section in a gymnastics club. And they um, kind of had a dispute about um, competition issues and so on. So they left the gymnastics club, went to this cafe Gisela, where you see it's, it was a typical cafe in Munich around that time and uh, they founded this new club and they named themselves FC Bayern and the C stands for club is already an English word they didn't use the German word Verein which would be old-fashioned they wanted to be very modern modern is also a word which came up or was used very often at that time the modernness of 1900 and um, yes and um, of course FC Bayern most of the players weren't from Munich or Bavaria but they wanted to inspire the people you know who lived there and to refer to the region um, maybe one special thing about it that there were already two Jewish um, founding members um, Benno Elkan he is a quite um, well-known sculpture because his menorah is still standing in front of the main entrance of the Knesset in Jerusalem. And also Josef Pollack, he was a merchant from Freiburg. He emigrated 1903 to New York. So also an American relation, maybe. Um, maybe let's have a look to what the people looked like or the first teams <laughs> looked like at that time. That's a team picture from 1904. Um, which I find kind of funny and um, as you can see it was about finding a community of like-minded people who wanted to inspire people with an independent club for this new sport. So these members they ordered straw hats from Paris that was kind of a fun thing you know to show off a little bit and to come to the games in carriages with suits and fine clothes. And I think it's important to understand, you know, um, that they had the common spirit of playing this new sport. The important thing was the same mindset. Um, religion or um, origin was not important. I mean, within that social range, of course. They wanted to play football. And for Jews, it was at a place where after having gone through the emancipation, they could feel free feel comfortable there, a place where they were socially accepted and recognized. And a remarkable fact about FC Bayern is that in the year 1933, when Hitler came into power, there are an estimated 10% of the members were Jewish, and they had a Jewish president and a Jewish coach. Um, so now one of the most um, important and inspiring personalities I want to introduce you to you now. Um, it is Kurt Landauer. It, he was um, the Jewish president. He was a member since 1901. Um, and he was president for 18 years um, with some breaks. 
He came from a merchant family. His father owned a fashion store in the heart of Munich. Um, he became president for the first time in 1913. He then fought in the First World War, as many Jewish people did. You know, um, they were very patriotic about it. He was very Bavarian too. He wore lederhosen and spoke obviously Bavarian. Um, he then um, later on changed jobs and um, uh, was responsible for newspaper ads, a big newspaper um, in Munich. And he fought for the professionalization of um, soccer. You know, he put in the first um, accident insurance for the players, the first uh, professional headquarter of FC Bayern Munich and many things else. So he, he dedicated actually his whole life to sports, a very interesting person. Well then in 1938, after the Reichsprogramm Nacht in November 9, when whole Germany, the synagogues, uh, synagogues burned, Landauer and also 18 former FC Bayern members were interned in the concentration camp in Dachau for 33 days. So that was actually the signal for him to escape and um, to flee from Germany. He fled to exile to Switzerland, to Geneva. Four of his siblings were killed in the Holocaust, but he survived in Switzerland. And then he decided in 1947 to come back to Munich, where his girlfriend lived. And then he was also elected president again at FC Bayern. So there were maybe um, well, the, it's very hard to figure out numbers, but maybe only 100 Jews who came back to Munich who had emigrated before, and he was actually one of them, and um, tried to put up his his old life. So it's a real interesting personality, and of course he has one panel out there in this special exhibition. Um, well, Landauer, it's interesting that he was somehow forgotten then in the club history. And it was actually more the fans. Um, I mean, there were some books uh, like in the 1990s who mentioned him and um, who did some research on his life. But actually, it was the fans who put, um, um, who did some research on his life. And here's this big fan choreography from 2014 uh, where they um, displayed him in the stadium and since uh, then we named the square in front of the Allianz Arena after him Kurt Landau we had uh, here a special event there we have now a statue at the Selbener Straße which is the headquarter in Munich um, so he's pretty well known today okay so now let's come to the heavy part now um, until then, as I said, we had many Jewish um, members. The main narrative of the club history was that since we had so many Jewish members, a Jewish president and a Jewish coach, that the club suffered many disadvantages during the Nazi period. But how was the club really involved in the regime? We wanted to find out. And so in t uh, 2017, FC Bayern commissioned a doctoral thesis on the time of the National Socialism at FC Bayern. And it was published uh, last September. I also brought the book here, so you can have a look at it later. Now, how did the club act? And did anyone resist the regime? And how uh, was it that the people played with the teammates together and agreed to the regime at the same time? How could that be? Um, let's have a, f a closer look to it. Now this is now a friendly game in um, 1933. You see people um, making the Hitler salute. Um, first of all, I think it's important to understand that we try to consider FC Bayern not just as a mirror of society, but as an active part, as a protagonist of society. Hitler came into power in 1933, and that changed everything also for FC Bayern. Basically, the willingness of German football clubs to adapt to the new Nazi rule was generally great. Nevertheless, not all of them behaved the same way. 
FC Bayern, for example, did sign the Stuttgart Declaration in April 1933 and committed itself to the removal of Jews from sports clubs. However, the club did not enforce an official exclusion at first. Jews could be active in soccer and the skiing department until 1935 at FC Bayern Munich. So that's actually a special role it had, but it will change then. Um, now, in 1935, um, However, many Jews already left the club by themselves. There was already a wave of resignations in 1933 with 41 persons leaving FC Bayern in the first months after Hitler's seizure of power. And it was then in March 1935 that club members passed anonymously a so-called Orion paragraph in the status saying that Jews were no longer allowed to be members. Initial exceptions were removed in September 35. Now, um, this so-called Orion proof, you, you know, you had to prove that you were of, of um, German, I mean, in terms of racial definition, um, um, German um, origin, to, uh, back to your grandfathers. Everyone had to fill it out and send it um, to the headquarter. Jews who did not resign voluntarily were said to have left. Um, now the club removed after this all of his Jewish long-term members and sponsors. So also Kurt Landau and all the um, other Jewish members of FC Bayern were obviously expelled from the club at the end of the year 1935. By 1936 there were no Jews in the club anymore. Oops, no, this one, okay. Now, just to mention the simultaneity of events, in 1936, the Olympic Games in Berlin took place. Um, now, here you see the picture that you mentioned um, with Willy Simitzer, that he was a, a um, Bayern player on the national team. Now, he has um, a picture taken here with Jesse Owens, the, the four, Gardel medalist winner and the, the star of the games, the American star, of course. Um, and he used um, this card, you know, as an um, autograph card. So it was, I guess, a statement by Willy Simitz Reiter, you know, as um, people, black colored people, were not much approved in the Nazi regime, you know, to use this card. Um, just one detail though, I mean, uh, to see how history reaches into our days, because at that time, every Brundage was um, the head of the American Olympic Committee, and there were, was a lot of discussions going on in the United States if um, the American team should boycott the Berlin Games. Um, every Brundage um, was against the boycott, and he was claiming the Olympic Games belong to the athletes and not to the politicians. So the same man, Avril Brundage, was then in the uh, Games in Munich in 1972, the uh, head of the International Olympic Committee, and he still held the same view. And after the Munich massacre, where 11 um, members of the Israeli team were killed and one Bavarian policeman, um, he said this real famous sentence at the uh, commemorative service, the games must go on. I mean, every, every inhabitant in Munich and probably Germany knows this sentence and he had the same view, you know, that the game should not be taken away uh, from uh, the athletes, but of course it's a decision which is being discussed a lot still till today. And actually last year we had the <coughs> 50th anniversary of the Munich massacre and also of the Olympic Games. And FC Bayern was also a cooperation partner um, um, at the commemoration um, select. Um, well, um, um, we had a memorial bike tour together with the Israeli consulate. So that's um, yeah how history reaches us still today. Um, 
Okay, now back to the history now. Now, how was it possible that the club changed its attitude and policy in regard of its Jewish members? Um, we have some people here who were in charge. I mean, he was not the only one. There was, of course, the club leader and so on. But for example, this was Theodor Sliepek. He was a so-called Dietwart at FC Bayern. Um, and the deed was, uh, was organizing the National Socialist Education, so his task was to bring the club into line ide ideologically. He pushed also the second uncompromising Orion paragraph in 1935. Um, and to show um, how it went on, now we're now in the year 1938. The radicalization of excluding Jews from civil rights and public life had become even more radical in 38. The clearest sign of this was the November program, as a result of which, at least in Germany, 400 Jews were murdered and 1,400 synagogues burned and 7,500 businesses were destroyed and plundered. How was FC Bayern involved? We now know that several Bayern members who worked for the Munich tax authorities took part in Arianization processes, which in turn affected Jewish Bayern members. Now, one of them was Max Schwegel, um, he's put up there on that list, the name. He was editor of the Club News in the 30s. He administered, for example, looted Jewish cultural property at the regional finance office. And um, now, that was actually the, the biggest robbery action uh, in the German Reich then. The American military um, administration after the war, they had to cooperate, of course, with the perpetrators from them. So they um, got him back. And so he had to write a list for the American <coughs> administration then to explain where um, from from which families he looted all, all the art collections. And if you look at these names, um, for example, well, he was a Bayern member, and then he looted, exam uh, for example, from Isidor Bach, which was also another Bayern member. It was a fa big fashion store. Then later, Ludwig Flörsheim, industrialist, he had been an FC Bayern member since 1920. He later emigrated. Then um, you got Riele Rosenthal, she's actually the sister of Kurt Landauer, the Jewish president. So imagine, you know, a Bayern member actually took the whole art collection of Landauer's sister even. Um, it was one of the biggest art collections in Munich because um, her husband Martin Rosenthal, who died before, um, was a big collector. And in 2006, um, the nephew of Gabriele Rosenthal and Kurt Landauer, a man named Uri Siegel, he received two books from their collection in a restitution action. So just two books were left actually and given to him that were found there. And then the last name, Martin Aufbau, that, that used to be actually the house bank of FC Bayern Munich. He was also a Bayern member and was looted. Okay, now I have one, uh, one perpetrator more to mention. Now here we have the club leader, Josef Kellner. Um, with the election of him, there was even a proven Nazi official at the ba FC Bayern board now. He was deployed as one of the highest ranking German officials in the Sudetengau the annexed part of Czechoslovakia, where he also participated in the persecution of Jews and Czechs. When he was elected, it was said the club had to adjust to new times. Kellner, however, was hardly ever present in Munich during his tenure, but he seemed an ideal solution. He was a former youth player, NSDAP member. He was a senior civil servant. Thus, the club sought proximity to the regime not least to secure its own existence. Okay, 
I now talked a lot about the perpetrators, but um, of course the whole exhibition we have outside focuses on the victims and the people, you know, who um, could somehow, um, you know, who were the Jewish members of the club. And the result of this historical research is, of course, a great impact on our historical and commemorative work in the club. Even before, we had initiated school programs. We did research on the Jewish biographies ourselves, and we created this traveling exhibition. It can be borrowed for free from uh, for schools or by fan clubs. And it, had, it has already been shown in over 50 locations in Germany, Austria, and the United States. And it also enables, of course, communities to discuss, learn, and talk about the perspectives of of the victims, the roots of nazism, and to make sure that this will never happen again. Um, now here I collected some uh, pictures of our commemorative work. Now here you see um, the eyewitness, Abba Naor. He's talking to the um, youth um, teams of FC Bayern. Um, now here, this was also another action at the Holocaust Remembrance Day in January, I think three years ago. Um, and here we have the touring exhibition at the US Capitol. Now, in our opinion, it does not detract from the commendable commemorative work being done here. Rather, it makes it more credible to know all these facts. Self-criticism, transparency, and credibility are important because club history is not just about victories or trophies. Now, why was National Socialism attractive to people who had successfully played together with their Jewish club colleagues or sat on the board? Why did only a few resist? Such, such questions are disturbing, but they can also provide impetus for the educational work of the museum, which is committed to never again. Sport is sport, it should bring joy, entertain people, but it's also capable of so much more. And now I have a last video for you with our commemoration work and then I will be happy to take questions later. Hmm? Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Alexa.
Um, and now I'll introduce our next speaker. Um, Anton Löffelmeier, MA, studied history, ethnology, and historical auxiliary sciences since 1988 at the Munich City Archives. Uh, main areas of activities at the City Archives, management of the estate collection, supervision of digitalization projects, collaboration on publication and exhibitions, contact person for questions of uh, provenance research. Publications on Munich City history and Bavarian re regional history, including Jewish history, 2002 publication of an anthology of the history of an uh, antiquarian book, Traders Family, uh, Jack Rosenthal, uh, 2006 collaboration on the publication of Jewish Munich, 2020 contribution to the publication, well now I'm challenged, uh, Mart Vassel, I hope that I didn't, <laughs> uh, Munich between October 1918 and June 1919, Beyond that publication on Munich sport history, uh, 2009 monograph, which I will never try to even uh, pronounce, the lions under uh, swastika, 2016 contribution on uh, mm, uh, <laughs> Munich soccer. I, sorry, Tony. <laughs> um, and uh, and. Ton is now going to uh, to challenge the myth of Bayern Munich as a, as a Jewish team, or um, um, Munich 1816 as as a Nazi team. Uh, Tony, thank you so much for joining us at this uh, late hour, uh, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for this invitation to this event and talk and for the opportunity to speak about German football history, especially about the truest history of FC Bayern. Now, uh, one preface, uh, I know in, in the United States you, you say soccer if you mean German football, so when I say football, it is soccer. <laughs> let, let me begin. Uh, we all know the football club FC Bayern, it's known globally and with around 300,000 members, it is the sports club with the most members in the world. But have you ever heard of the Munich Gymnastics and Sports Club from 1860? 1860 for short. It has 25,000 members and plays in the third German football league. 19 years ago it was quite different. Both clubs dominated the football scene in Munich and were among the top clubs in Germany. FC Bayern were and are in German die Roten or in English the Reds, and 1860 are the Blauen or the Blues or the Lions. Red and blue are the main colors of the logos of both clubs. So, uh, about 10% of FC Bayern's members in 1932 were Jewish, as you heard already. This corresponded to five times the proportion of Jews in the Munich population. The high proportion of Jewish members, of Jewish coaches, and of Jewish staff in the departments and the high proportion of Jewish victims of National Socialism at Bayern promoted the narrative that the club was a Jewish club. Gregor Hoffmann, however, who published last year a dissertation about this time, said the annotation of a Jewish club cannot explain anything. While 1860 had a remarkable proportion of active NSDAP and SA members in the club even before 33. From 34 onwards, the entire leadership of the club held in some cases, high positions in the NSDAP, the SA and the SF. This has promoted the narrative that the club was a Nazi club. In my presentation, I will take a brief look at the history of both clubs between 1936 and examine whether these two attributions are tenable.
in order to understand and interpret the history of the two clubs during the Nazi era, we have to take a look at the founding history of both clubs around 1900. This is because the young athletes at that time often had leading positions in the clubs in the 30s. FC Bayern was founded in February 1900 in a wine restaurant in Munich, as you heard, after the founding members had left their previous club, the Männerturnverein. The founding of the new club was substantially supported by the Jewish football enthusiast and functionary Gustav Manning, who as a medical student in Freiburg had founded the Freiburg Football Club. Among the 17 founding members of FC Bayern were two other footballers of Jewish origin, Josef Pollack and Benno Elkan. Benno Elkan came from Dortmund, emigrated to London in 33 and became a famous sculptor, painter and writer. His most famous work is the seven branch bronze candelabrum in front of the Knesset in Jerusalem, which he worked on from 49 to 56. What makes a club interesting for Jews? Football was a modern, was modern, it was dynamic, much more dynamic than German gymnastics, which often consisted of predetermined exercise routines. In the game of football, spontaneous ideas could be developed. Football was open to individual abilities and achievements on the pitch as well as in, the, as in engagement for the club. Also, Jews could be active without religious and open social barriers. The players of the new club live mainly in the district of Maxvorstadt, around the university and in the district of Schwabing. In Schwabing, the club had also its first pitch, which was provided by a wealthy patron the cook stove and open manufacturer Friedrich Wamsler. On January 1906, FC Bayern merged with Munich's largest sports club, the Munich Sports Club. As a result, FC Bayern was thus able to use large pitches at Leopoldstraße in the heart of Schwabing. The players now wore white shirts and red shorts, and were therefore called the Reds or in German the Rotos. Since then, the club colors of FC Bayern have been red and white. From the very beginning, therefore, the club had the reputation of being a student club and a bourgeois elitist club based in the Bohemian district of Schwabing. At the same time, the club was considered a liberally and open club with connections nationally and internationally. From 1906 onwards, the club employed coaches from England, where the game was most developed in terms of tactical play. The club thus had a founding myth based on objective facts, students and Schwabing. This myth still clings to the club today. 1860 was not a pure football club. It was a gymnastics club that was founded as early as 1860 it was one of the largest gymnastic clubs in Germany. It was a model for Schwarz State in miniature. It had its own fire brigade, a large club library, and a Red Cross department. The members consisted of craftsmen, self-employed, middle-class employees, civil servants, merchants, and members of the Bavarian army. Senior civil servants and doctors were chairman of the club. In 1900, when FC Bayern was founded, the club already had 1,800 members. The basic spirit of 1860 was decidedly national and patriotic, in part anti-Semitic. City leaders and the magistrates supported the club with generous concessions for the purchase of land, and financial support for competition trips. Here a look at club grounds in 1905. When a football team was founded in 1899, 
It was made up of members of the gymnastic department, and the foundation was not a new football club, but already established gymnasts founded a football department. However, the football section increasingly became more and more important within the club. There were Jewish members in the club, but the proportion was certainly below 2% that made up the Jewish population unit. From 1908 onwards, the club built a football pitch and then a stadium in the working class <coughs> district of Gizi, on the other side on the Isar. This led to the club being referred to as a working class club, often in contrast to the Schwabinger Tum of FC Bayern. After the First World War, the returning soldiers, but also many other men and women interested in sports, flocked to the gymnastics and sports clubs. Sport became a mass and a spectator phenomenon. Both clubs, therefore, had a considerable increase in membership in the period after the First World War. Both clubs charged high entrance fees and spent high amounts on football stars and coaches. Football experienced a commercialization push and a professionalization. FC Bayern, like other top clubs, brought in coaches from abroad, from Hungary, Austria and England. In particular, representatives of the so-called Daniel football from Hungary and Austria, which was considered particularly modern, were in demand. Coaches like Isidor Dori Kirschner, Leo Weiss, Feynman Konrad and Richard Little Dombey were internationally active and they were all Jewish coaches. 1860 brought the best German coaches to the Isar like former Karlsruhe international Max Breuning. <coughs> Both clubs rose to the top of the German league in 1927 and 33 the Löwen, the Lions, reached the semi-finals of the German championship. In 1931, the Lions lost in the final against Hertha BSC Berlin. FC Bayern won the South German championship in 1926 and 28 reached the semi-finals of the German Championship in 1928 and became German champions for the, for the first time in 1932. Interestingly, under the Jewish coach Richard Dombey, who had coached rival 1860 before, Now, uh, have a look to the club structures. First, FC Bayern. In January 1990, Kurt Landauer, a Jew, as you heard, once again took over the presidency of FC Bayern, which he has already held from 1930 to 1914. He held it with a brief interruption until March 1933. Under Kurt Landauer, the club developed modern structures it sought international coaches at meetings as it had before the war. And it built up a very intensive and successful youth program. However, the club's financial situation rapidly worsened in the Great Depression that broke out in 1929. Spectator numbers fell by a quarter from the 31-32 season to the next season, as did revenues. Nevertheless, the club was still able to report a low profit of 1,800 Reichsmarks at the end of the 2032-33 season. In general, the high proportion of Jewish members continued during the Weimarer Republic. In 1932, the year of the championship, FC Bayern had still about 10% Jewish members. Oh, 
So, now the question, was the club a Jewish club? Or what role did Jews and Judaism play at FC Bayern? It is striking that FC Bayern had numerous company teams affiliated with it that had a high proportion of Jewish players. Thus, as the München Kammerspiele, one of Munich's best known theaters. Jewish companies such as the Ulfelder department stores had also joined FC Bayern. There were also a number of sponsors who came from the Jewish milieu, especially from the textile industry, such as the Bamberger and Herz Company. A Jewish connotation to Bayern thus seems quite conceivable. Till now, we don't know if this connotation was made by the supporters, by the opposing fans, or by the public at all. It is not easy to find it out, because sports coverage at that time was fo focused mainly on what happened on the pitch. And there is no contemporary oral or written evidence of this yet. There was no social media. So, it has still to be searched. Another question was, is the Bayern the club for Munich Jews? The fact is, many Jewish members of FC Bayern were also active in other clubs. Thus, as a genuinely Zionist Bar Kopfa, or in other clubs. In addition, Jews also met supporters of National Socialism at FC Bayern in the club in the 1920s. Some of them also had club offices, like Friedrich Herzog. <coughs> he had been a member of FC Bayern since 1907 and a member of, S of the NSDAP since 1922. In 1934, he was uh, FC Bayern's chief treasurer and also attended the Reichspartei target during that time. But Landau recounts in retrospect in 1947 that Herfer had made no secret of his NSDAP membership, but Landauer said, we always stood together in friendship. So, it seems people met in the club situationally for sports and club activities. The club was <coughs> only one part of the lives of assimilated Munich Jews. For many, certainly not the defining one. There was only one view among the newly elected club leadership of FC Bayern on July 32. It was Kutlanda. To sum up, before 1933, FC Bayern had an above average proportion of Jewish members, but also, but FC Bayern also had members and supporters of the Völkisch movement and the National Socialists. Denominational Judaism in particular played no perceptible role in the club's life. As we know, no consideration was given to Jewish holidays or festivities in Met scheduling. As far as it's known, the club is not perceived as a Jewish club by the public or in politics in the 20s. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. Here it goes. Now to uh, 1860. Let's first take a look to the end of the First World War in Munich regarding 1860. After the end of World War I, there was a revolution in Munich in November 1918. The Bavarian king was overthrown on the 7th November 1918. Bavaria became a democracy. Nevertheless, Anarchy and chaos reigned in Munich and two Soviet republics were formed. The second Soviet republic was bloodily put down in May 1919 by paramilitary units and the regular Reichswehr. 
A number of members of 1860 fought on the side of the paramilitary units, and the club provided the Freikorps troops with accommodation and food. In 1860, a network of sympathizers and activists of the Folkish movement had already formed in the early 20s. The club made training grounds available to the Reichswehr in the Freiko Oberland and later to the SA, contrary to the provisions of the Treaty of Versailles, which stipulated a strict separation of civilian and military sports. Several club numbers of 1860 took part as gunmen in the so-called Hitler Putsch in the early hours of 9th November 1923. The Putsch, initiated by Hitler and his combat units, aimed to establish a dictatorship in Germany. It failed at the Feldhandel in Munich due to the resistance of the Bavarian state police. All 1860 club chairmen from 1934 onwards were involved in the Hitler push. The most important event in the 20s for the club was the construction of a large football stadium on the club's own grounds on Grünwalder Straße. In 1925 and 1926, the club expanded the ground into Munich's largest, largest stadium facility at that time. The stadium was also used by other clubs as tenants including FC Bayern. This seems lucrative, but large debts and loans had been taken out for the stadium construction and the club was unable to repay the debts regularly in the beginning of the Great Depression. The number of spectators and thus the income declined rapidly. In addition, membership fees also declined. In the summer of 31, 40% of 1860s members were unemployed. Membership had fallen to the level of 1920. To zoom up, first there was a strong Polish faction in the club and a remarkable number of active NSDAP members in the 20s. Second, the club had high debts from the construction of the stadium, which grew even more after the stock market crash in 1929. Now, the clubs during the National Socialist era. After Adolf Hitler's appointment as Reich Chancellor on the 30th January 1933, the bourgeois sports clubs were able to observe how the National Socialists dissolved the Socialist and Communist sports clubs within two months, and also killed or arrested leading functionaries. The boards of FC Bayern in 1860 were thus warned. The new leaders could destroy existing traditional structures in sport at any time. At FC Bayern, Kurt Landauer resigned as president in March 33, voluntarily but under pressure of political surroundings. He was succeeded by the former secretary Siegfried Hermann as board member. On the 9th April 33, the club signed a declaration of the South German Football and Athletics Association, propagating the removal of Jews from sports club. Alexa has already mentioned this declaration. The clubs of the Federation implemented this declaration in different ways. First, Football Club Nuremberg, for example, expelled its Jewish members from the club by letter on the end of April 33. But Bayern did not. Anyway, in November 33, over 40 Jewish members had left the club, about a third of the Jewish membership. Among them were some who had previously supported the club financially. This meant that the anti-Semitic dynamic power in 33 also directly affected sports and FC Bayern. Though until October 33, Bayern's statute still stated the club is politically and religiously neutral. 
It is likely that the leading of the championship coach Richard Dombey in summer 33 was connected to this anti-Semitic dynamic. In the club news it was pointed out that in filling the coaching position no sacrifice should be too great if it can thereby serve the German and national cause. So the club then hired an Aryan German coach, the sports teacher Hans Taucher. After all, Dombey was accepted as a new member in September 33 when he was already in Barcelona. In 34, Siegfried Hermann installed the Council of Elders. Members with 20 or more years of membership were represented, represented in it. According to research, nine Jewish members were among them, and also among national socialists. This shows that Siegfried Hermann was quite willing to put up a fight against radical anti-Semitism anti-Semitized in the club when it came to present the club as a community of old, very old Bayerns. Here he made no distinction between Jewish and non-Jewish members. But at the annual general meeting on 19 September 34, however, Hermann resigned. On March 35, the club put a paragraph in its status for the first time that persons of non-Aryan decent could not be members of the club. Half a year later, this Aryan paragraph was made even stricter by abolishing all exceptions. For example, to allow non-Aryan front fine fighters of World War I to remain in the club. Nevertheless, the exclusion of all non-Aryans does not seem to have been completely successful. Thus, in the club newspapers from November 36, the so-called Detroit, and its representatives in the club for National Socialist Training, so the Dietmar complained about the harmful influence and presence of members of non-human tribes and races at the club's regular status. However, the presence of Jews in the club did not result in any discrimination on the Nazi city administration. The city even endeavored to take important players into public service. In 1935, Ludwig Goldbrunner and Wilhelm Simmelsreiter, both players in the German national team, were taken into public service with the active support of the Nazi mayor Fieler and the second mayor Temple. Also, none of the players had publicly committed themselves to the NSDAP. Now, what about a possible attribution as a Jewish club from the supporters of the opposing clubs in the Nazi era? But as in Weimarer Republic, there is no evidence of this in the Nazi era. Another indication may be that the Nazi press, such as Völkische Beobachter or Stürmer, did not agitate against the club. There is only one source from 44 that could suggest that the club was named as a Jewish club. In March 44, FC Bayern won the South Bavarian Championship, one year after the Lions. And the Office for Physical Education suggested to the mayor Karl Fieler, that an evening of honor should be held for the champions in the city hall. But the mayor's office refused. They noted the circumstances had changed and 1860 had other relations with the city. And they noted that FC Bayern had been led by a Jew until the takeover. This sentence appears as an official sign for a Jewish club attribution. Apparently, however, the note did not come from Fieler himself, but from his office manager, who was obviously a supporter of 1860. Also, 
between 1943 and 1944, conditions in and for the German Reich had indeed decreased drastically. The air raids had destroyed large parts of the city in the meantime. A public reception would probably not have gone down so well with the population. Besides, Bayern had already been officially honored by the Gausport-Bühr in the dental stadium, and Fieler had repeatedly attended Bayern matches in the past. Though this document is not so well suited for negative attribution of the club by the city leadership or as evidence for an attribution as a Jewish club in Nazi era. To sum up, FC Bayern, first, FC Bayern did not formally exclude the Jews, but after three years of Nazi regime, there were hardly any Jewish members in the club. Second, FC Bayern was obviously not discriminated by Nazi leaders during the first years of the Nazi era. And third, FC Bayern was apparently not perceived as a Jewish club by the Nazi leaders. Now, um, at the end, a short uh, few uh, at 1860. Soon after the National Socialists came to power in February March 33, a strong Polish group was able to take over leadership positions in the club. Even before that, the club left no doubt that it was willing to follow the new rulers on the path to national dictatorship. On 20, 22nd March 33, the, cup, the club published the following statement in the Munich Daily Newspaper. The Gymnastic and Sports Club Munich from 1860 joyfully welcomes the rebirth of German nationalism, German unity and inner freedom that has sprung from the Turkish transformation. This could happen smoothly because Heinrich Tisch, the longtime German, had already resigned from his position as head of 1860 in the second half of 32. Reasons for this cannot be found in the club's archive. Apparently, there were discussions in the gymnastic department about this leadership style. Possibly, he was partly to blame for the club's high debts. Possibly, there was hostility from the ranks of the National Socialists. Wilhelm Hacker was elected successor as president of the gymnastic department on the 28th March 33, and soon of the whole club. He promised to lead the club on a national basis. No other Munich gymnastic and sports club handed so massively to the new rulers in public. On 8 April 33, the German gymnastic association, of which the gymnastic club was a member, signed a declaration in Stuttgart deciding to exclude Jewish members from the gymnastic clubs. The day after, 1860 joined the declaration of the South German Football and Athletic Association. So did FC Bayern, as he said already. On September 33, a general meeting of the club decided to implement the Führer principle. We remember, four weeks later, General, the general meeting of FC Bayern also decided to. In April 34, SA leader Fritz Ebenberg was elected as a new leader of 1860. Under his leadership, on February 1935, the club adopted the so-called Aryan paragraph, stating that persons of non-Aryan descent could not be members of the club. As we heard, FC Bayern included the same paragraph four weeks later in the statute. So we see the anti-Semitic power of, from the regime was formally implemented in both clubs at nearly the same time. However, it was obvious that it was not so easy to establish a new political line in all departments of the club. <clears throat> At the end of 35, the football department published an obituary in the club's newsletter for the Jewish football player Robert von Wien, who had died in December 35 and had played for many years in the club's reserve team. 
also in the year 1936, they attempt to establish the Obenish, a prominent Nazi leader, as head of the department, failed due to the resistance of the old leadership. It was not until 41 that Sebastian Gleichner, member of the NSDAP city council faction, who had already been one of the most ruthless leaders of the NSDAP in Munich before 33, took over as head of the football department. There were only a few Jewish members of 1860 in 33. Under the intense pressure of the new club leaders, we assume that till the end of 35, they had all gone. To assume up, 1860 leadership was obviously strongly dominated by a clique of NSDAP party supporters during the Nazi era. Second, nevertheless, the football department was obviously able to maintain a certain independence for several years. So, let's come to the end. Now, the summary. The term Nazi club can explain a lot in relation to 1860, the close involvement to the leading cadres in the Nazi state. However, it does not allow any conclusions to be drawn as to how far the 3,000 members differed in the attitude and NS party membership from the average population. This still needs to be investigated. And uh, to FC Bayern, I do not agree with Gregor Hoffmann's statement that the description of FC Bayern as a Jewish club cannot explain anything. But I, I would modify it. It can offer an explanation that until 33, the club was uh, very attractive to assimilated Jews who wanted to live out their integration into the German majority society in a politically neutral and confessional non-founded sports club. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, and now I'm delighted to introduce our own uh, Professor Tamir Sorek. Uh, Tamir Sorek uh, studies culture as a field of conflict and resistance, uh, particularly in the context of Palestine-Israel. His research has highlighted uh, the political role of sports, poetry and collective memory, as well as tensions around the boundaries of religious and secular realms. He is the author of The Optimist, a social biography of Tawfiq Zayed, Palestinian commemoration in Israel, calendar, monument and martyrs, and Arab soccer in a Jewish state. Uh, Sorek edited, co-edited volumes on sport, society, and politics in the Middle East. Currently, is the co-editor of the newly established journal, Palestine Israel Review. The floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> so, it is late, uh, and I will be very short with uh, my comments. And I would like uh, first uh, to thank uh, you for inviting me to talk here, and uh, uh, to thank Tony for the lecture, and Alexa, and Dee, and Lou for your intervention. Thank you. Um, there, were, there were two questions that were raised here. Um, one, to what extent we can see uh, Bayern as an anti-Nazi uh, uh, bastion, or and to what extent we can see it as a Jewish uh, club. And I, w I would like to suggest that um, Bayern, unlike most teams in the Bundesliga and elsewhere, basically at every different point highlighted or minimized different aspects of identity that served them at that particular point in time. It is an instrumental behavior, but this is how human behaves. It's not uh, something that is especially judgmental about. Obviously, for the purpose of branding Bayern today, you would like to emphasize to what extent they were anti-Nazi and accommodating Jews, um, but uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Um, I, I w so I will um, uh, n not talk much about the uh, Nazi period because it was uh, discussed here and we could see that there were different occasions uh, uh, where uh, Bayern behaved better than others and in other cases Bayern behaved like most others. For example, I think something that was not mentioned here is that in 1940 the team went to visit 
a good rounder in uh, Switzerland uh, and took a risk because the Gestapo didn't like it. Um, after the, the war, appointing a Jewish Holocaust survivor as a president was very useful uh, for uh, proving the denazification uh, uh, efforts of a team. So uh, it, it is likely that the, uh, in Munich they knew it and he was appointed. I'm saying that because shortly after the US forces left, he was removed from his position, something that we should remember. And from 1957, uh, Byron had a CEO who was a former uh, Waffen-SS uh, uh, sur uh, senior surgeon uh, for many years. So I, I, don't, I don't know what he did in the war, but I think that today it would have been impossible because today Bayern is aspiring to be an international uh, club. And you cannot brand yourself in the international sphere, not in the US, not in other countries, US in Europe, when your CEO has a, a pass of uh, being uh, uh, serving in the Waffen SS. So there is a lot of um, elements of, uh, which are instrumental and uh, I can uh, understand that. What I do want to discuss a little bit uh, in a more critical uh, perspective is the recent adoption of the uh, IHRA definition of anti-Semitism by uh, Bayern Munich. And uh, Bayern Munich, as you mentioned, has a social responsibility and it took a position here. The IHRA definition, the International Holocaust Remembrance Association definition of anti-Semitism um, is a very problematic definition. We cannot fight anti-Semitism without defining it, so we should define it, but when we define it, we should define it properly and accurately. Uh, many hundreds of scholars of Middle East, Jewish studies, Israeli studies have criticized it. Some of them are in, in this room, uh, among our scholars, and suggested alternative definition. And our issues was, our issue was, is that this definition conflates criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. Uh, it um, de uh, delegitimizes comparison of Israel to uh, uh, the Nazi policy. It delegitimizes uh, uh, ascribing racism to the state of Israel. And by that, it includes many things which are not anti-Semitism under this definition. And it hurts the real fight against real anti-Semitism. Um, I will just give you one example that uh, shows to what ex uh, the extent to which this is an absurd definition. In uh, 1984, um, a member, uh, uh, Kahana, Mary Kahana was elected as a member of the Knesset in Israel. And um, he was leading a movement, the Kach movement. And their platform was explicitly racist. Now, a member of the Likud party, the right-wing Likud <laughs> party, published a document where he compared this platform to the Nuremberg law, laws. Um, to the extent to th that they were racist. Now, according to this definition of the IHRA, Mikhail Eitan, this member of the Likud party, is anti-Semite. And Bayern Munich adopted that uh, definition. Now, is this does this be belong to the past? No. Today, a student and the uh, successor of Mayor Kahana is a, is a uh, minister in the Israeli cabinet. Today. This day, when you're talking. So, he's he learned uh, for legal purposes not to use explicit racist word. You know when anti-Semites in the US, they do not want to blame Jews for something, they blame Zionists. Even if Jews, these Jews are not Zionists. So you use other words. But uh, it, basically his perspective is the same like his teacher. Now, the IHRA, which Bayern Munich adopted, prevents me from now making this comparison and tell the world, look, there is a problem here. So uh, I'm saying that within this responsibility of Bayern Munich to fight anti-Semitism um, and uh, uh, to promote a uh, fight against racism el elsewhere, it, Bayern Munich should be not one of these several clubs in the Bundesliga who adopted this uh, definition. It, and I, I think it is very important. I think what we do now is what, how we'll be remembered several decades from now. So let's start work now. So I'm just, um, uh, without trying uh, uh, to undermine the very important and general intention of people who work in Bayern Munich to fight anti-Semitism, I want to point out to a, a problem, and there is a, a certain gap here between the intention and what I see actually as the potential effect of, uh, of uh, this uh, adoption. Thank you very much.
um, thank you very much, Tamir. And now, uh, in the time that we have left, I, I would like to open um, the floor for uh, for questions and answers. Um, we have uh, we've heard uh, several presentations here, and I'm sure that we can uh, follow up on points that Tamir made, or Tony, or Alexa, and. Um, Yeah, so uh, you want to take it? Yes, <laughs> yes I, I see it that way, actually. It was rather a, a certain milieu, milieu thing. Um, I mean, we don't even know if the Jews, I mean, the, the Jewish member were in a, a certain group or so. I mean, many of them didn't even know from each other that they were also Jewish. You know, they, they, they might have known it, but probably not, I think. And the reason why so many Jewish members were there was also that in the 1920s, the, these um, company teams came up and they didn't even play in the professional league, but they had their own league. They, they became members and they would work for um, like a fashion store or so, and then all of them would join FC Bayern and then have their just leisure time games on the weekends. So that's um, also the reason why they joined the FC Bayern. You might also imagine that social network processing, once you had initial yes, members, yes, they right. spread out. And yes. They joined friends, joined right, cousins right. and brothers and yes. whatever. And we know that many of them were located in the very city hall of Munich, you know, with the, because we now set up a guided tour and then you can really see. So here, um, this Jewish member had um, his shop here and there, so they were all located in the city center, and then so I guess probably they were kind of networking. Thank you. Uh, one question about how the fans uh, relate to this uh, initiative to give account of history. Uh, fan groups uh, in many countries are very much related to mainstream cultural life, mm -hmm. like Serbia, Israel. Uh, well, actually, they are very active in the um, anti-racism work. Um, we are very lucky to have not the problem of right-wing um, ultra groups in the club, but they are rather left-orientated. And um, especially the Shikadia, the, the picture I showed of Landauer, that was their idea. Actually, they also founded a poor Landauer Stiftung, which is kind of a um, organization, and they dedicate themselves only to historical topics and they have their own page and so on. And they are very active. Um, and they also collect things. We have a lot of uh, donations by them in, in our archives, actually. So, Yes, we're actually in this <coughs> lucky situation <coughs> that we don't really have a right-wing problem among the fans. I mean, I'm not saying that there aren't any, because um, if you have a film stadium with 75,000 people, of course, I would think it's like a society, but they don't really show up. Um, Tony, do you want to comment on the uh, current uh, fan base of both clubs? Is, is, there, is there any question uh, to, uh, yeah. to um, so yeah. the, there was a question here about the um, uh, the current situation of the fan base of uh, of uh, in regards to um, right wing activism or radicalism um, and if you want to comment on uh, either 1860 or FC Bayern. Yeah. Um, 
as you know that I'm a member of 1860, so I can uh, give uh, uh, um, comment to, to the situation in the, in the 1860 uh, supporter scene or fan scene. Uh, there is there's a problem uh, of, of, of uh, uh, supporters of the uh, of, of the Nazis in in 1860. Um, in uh, essay, uh, uh, they had um, the matches in the Allianz Arena with uh, uh, 2006 onwards to. Uh, uh, 2014, there was a special uh, with a block number 132. In this block, uh, gathered neo Nazis. Uh, about in every every match, there were about 50, 60, 100 neo Nazis, um, and, and and they gave a uh, um, uh, uh, yes, they they uh, they were. They give the, they were assigned, uh, and and the, the the club was not able to push them out. That um, was a problem for many years. Now, uh, 1860 uh, played in the in the third league, and they, they changed in their own former own stadium in Grünwalderstraße with only 15,000 uh, spectators. Uh, um, this this group of neo-Nazis was spread because they got no chance to gather there in the stadium. And, and there is an active, meanwhile there is an active band scene to fight against this group. And, and so it's, I, I think it's going better and, and the, the club um, is, yeah, what, uh, do something to uh, to to bring them out of the stadium. I, I I don't know how it is by by FC Bayern. Perhaps Alexa uh, can say something. Yeah, she uh, she commented on it. Uh, yeah. Thank you. <coughs> yes, please. Any other questions? All right, so um, before I conclude, uh, I invite you to, uh, to visit the exhibition here. Um, it's going to be around for another month here, and then it moves to the uh, Penn State uh, Old Sports Museum, where you can also see the, uh, the exhibition on the Penn State athletes during World War II. Um, I want to thank all our participants today, Alexa, Dee, Lou, Tamir, and Tony that stayed up so late <laughs> in Germany to join us. And, and thank you all for coming. Uh, there's still cookies and coffee and, uh, and juice, so help yourself on the way out. And thank you all so very much. Thank you.